Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome again to Fall River Heritage State Park. DCR, Fall River Heritage State Park, is part of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I recognize a lot of faces here. My name is Jim Lopes. I'm Visitor Services Supervisor here. And we've had a wonderful summer of great programs celebrating industry in Fall River. We've talked about the, the welling industry in Fall River. We've talked about textiles. We've celebrated uh, hat making and uh, leather craft. And today, we have uh, Taylor Silver from the uh, Fall River Public Library Center for Reference Services here. And he's going to take us back to the beginning. Fall River is this mighty industrial center in, uh, in the, the country, in the world. And how did it all begin? Why did the uh, why did industry start here? Why did we have what did the textiles? What did everything else here? The presentation today is called The Rivers and the Rail, which takes us back to the beginning. Taylor's been here before. You guys have enjoyed his, uh, his presentations. And the last one was on the, uh, uh, the skeleton of the arm. That was terrific. So, At the end of the program, if you'd like to get on our mailing list, uh, we have an email list outside. This is our final program of the season. OK? Final program of the season. Thank you all for coming all season. And next year, this is kind of a teaser here. Next year, we're celebrating the people of Fall River. OK, so next year, it's uh, immigration to Fall River. All the immigrants, past and present, will have a series of exhibits outside and a number of programs going to celebrate all the various cultures of Fall River, um, going back to the very beginning. So that's pretty exciting. And to get you set for that, we have a special treat today. We have a film called The Fabric of Fall River, which used to play in this theater. Uh, years ago, and then fell into disrepair. And our friend here, Mr. Rice, Stephen Rice, from Fall River Media, has spent the last two years restoring this film. Now, I'm not supposed to show this film until May of 2019, but I'm all excited because Steve stopped by this afternoon with a, with a couple of DVDs. So I'm going to show you the first five minutes of it. And if you don't tell anybody, I won't tell anybody I did it, okay? But I'm not supposed to show up. Got a deal? It's, it's, it's absolutely terrific. Uh, this is called The Fabric of Fall River, and it gets us, it actually sets us in the right mind frame to receive the rivers and the rail. Okay, so hold on. My family has been on this bay since the beginning of the area as far as the white man was concerned. I think they were in this area by the late 1630s. Well, my mother came from England. Her name was Entwistle. And she came from Ramsbottom, near Lancashire. Well, I was born in Ireland. I was 21 when I came here. It was a matter of getting a job. My father came from a beautiful little village called Saint Denis or Richelieu, which is not far from Montreal. I came to Fall River from Aberdeen, Scotland. I was two months and a half old when my father, God bless his soul, came to Fall River from St. Michael's, Azor. All they thought America, that money was plentiful here. They even pennies, they threw them away. Arrivals. New beginnings. They came to a land of possibility, trading the known for the what might be. Some came with only the promise of a job and a few faded photographs. But they wove their lives together and built a city. The spirit of its people is the fabric of Fall River. The 
everything was here. You had shellfish and seafood and beautiful farming area, and you had this great, fantastic two lakes or ponds that we call Watapa. Because the water that made Fall River was the Fall River, <laughs> the Falling River. The Indians call it Kukwishan. Here in Narragansett Bay and Mount Hope Bay, we have this beautiful natural harbor that is unsurpassed. The Indians were all over this area in canoes. The white men simply said, well, we'll use the same system too. My family, the church family, they were involved here with the huge land purchases. And of course, Benjamin Church was the one who organized the colonists against King Philip in the 1670s. We were farmers. We were farming around here. Fogo was a typical agrarian community. In 1811 was the first mill, and of course, these smart men realized that if Slater could run a cotton mill in Pawtucket, with water power, we could run a cotton mill in Fall River because we had the Quikuchan River. And only two years later, they started the Fall River Manufactory in the Troy. It wasn't, say, a Boston company that decided to go out and organize mills on the river. It was people that were basically farmers, people that knew the value of land and how valuable it would become. These people were visible in city affairs, they were visible in the building of the churches, the public institutions, and the hospitals. It's all the same names. The Borden family were the premier entrepreneurs in Fall River. So we're going to be showing that all next season. We're going to have a big premiere and everything. But uh, all you guys, since you, you're, you're, you're my devotees, you come every time. Um, get your names on the list out there. Okay, we'll invite you to the first screenings here. All right? And now I'd like to bring to our podium our guest speaker today. It's Taylor Silva from the Forward Public Library. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me here once again. Uh, today, my presentation, like Jim said, it is called The Rivers and the Rail. And we're going to be looking at how the Quickishan River was an economic boon to Fall River. So there's a little bit of a story about how I started this little project for us. I originally had an, a different idea for another project that I was told, hey, maybe we should hold off on this. Can you think of something else that you want to present about? So I'm racking my brain and I'm thinking and thinking and thinking. And every time I do a presentation like this, I try to not only present on a topic that would interest you guys, but also something that interests me personally as well. Because if somebody, whoever's presenting, isn't enjoying themselves as they present, you know, having fun with it, doing the research, and also, more importantly, presenting it to an audience, you're not going to get anything worthwhile. You know what I mean? So as I was thinking, I was trying to think back, okay, what do I personally enjoy about history? You know, what about Fall River is really, really fun that I could go out and talk about, do a little bit of research and present something to an audience? And I thought back when I was a child, you know, between like four and eight years old, I had three main obsessions. One was dinosaurs, one was Pokemon, and the other was trains. And I remember my grandparents bringing me to Fall River, you know, to the carousel, and we would look at the battleship, you know, the battleship cove, and then we would go like not even a block away, and we'd go to the uh, train museum, and we'd see all the tracks and the locomotives and the train cars that were there. And it's like, oh wow, you know. You know, playing with trains is all well and good, but when you actually, when you're like this tall and you see an actual train car or a locomotive, you're like, oh, cool, you know, this is what it was. So after thinking about, you know, oh, gee, I love trains as a kid, you know, Fall River, history of trains and the Fall River line on the, sea, on the, on the water, that's when I started thinking, okay, I think I can do something on this topic. So 
as I started my, this presentation here, I came across this particular, there's two pictures. This first one is Cole Brothers World Circus. The, the pictures were taken around 1935, I believe. Yes, yeah, so the summer of 1935. And at the time, railroad circuses would travel like oftentimes like in four sections and they'd have 60 cars like, you know, with animals and tricks and people and their equipment. And with that image, you know, personal interest, you know, circuses are all like really, really cool. And just seeing these pictures made me excited about seeing trains again. So that's a little bit of history behind why I'm putting this presentation on. And these really beautiful pictures, in my opinion, with the cars and the flatbeds and those horses right there, just really cool stuff. So to kick things off, we're gonna look at Fall River in location to different cities and towns and how really lucky even today how central we are to a lot of cities. We have, we're around 50 miles away from Boston, around 200 miles from New York, New York City, 17 from Taunton, New Bedford's 18 miles east, uh, excuse me, Providence, 18 miles west, New Bedford, 14 miles east, and we have Newport just south of us, 18 miles. So I'm gonna reiterate this over and over and over again during my presentation. It's location, 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 not only to different cities and towns that we're close to, but how close we are to the water and open sea, you know, open sea and salt water. So my first question that we're gonna look at is how did a rail and steamship operation succeed? Well, we have the Quekishan River and Wotapa Ponds, and they, those provide commercial and economic opportunities for us. Back in the day, of course, we have the textile and metal factories and the mills that we just saw in that five minute clip just now. The travel accommodations on water and rail, that's really what I'm going to be focusing on today. And again, our location to maiden metropolitan centers such as Boston and New York City. And there's also other smaller uh, cities and towns with their own economies and uh, commodities, with Newport and their whale products, Somerset and pottery, and Dighton and strawberries and other flora. So the Quick Shan River, some quick burst of info for you, runs 2.7 miles from its source, the South Watapa Pond, and the flow of the river is 121 and a half cubic feet per second, or, this is the fun one, uh, 9,841,500,000 gallons per year. A lot. A lot more, I assumed it was a big number before I saw this number. It's like, oh, holy cow, it really puts it into consideration. Like, holy cow, it's a lot of water. And it features three different environments that we're gonna be looking at, I think on the next slide, that proved to be critical for Fall River. The first is that freshwater environment near the ponds, the falls in the hillside where, the, where Fall River is, and our saltwater coastal environment. And here's a cool little uh, map that I found in one of the sources that I was looking at. It gives you a little Get the mouse out of the way. A little map of the ponds, Mount Hope Bay, some really, really cool little things. You have Stafford Pond on the side. I'm take a look at that before I move on. Does anybody have any questions yet? If anyone has any questions during the presentation, just put up your hand or we can wait till the end, whatever you guys are more comfortable with. So we have this little map that I found as well, really simple image for you. We have that freshwater environment described as a flat landscape and served as water storage for power and processing and provided limited navigation for sails and 
other small uh, watercraft. And you have the falls. Don't have to really go into that in much detail, but it has a steep topo topography with a gradient, the gradient in water, you know, this, that steep sudden drop produces power. And finally, we have our salt water and coastal environment where the mouth of the river meets the coast with navigable water. Okay, our first environment is that fresh water environment that I mentioned. It's a flat landscape and served as a water storage for power and processing for the mills and also provided limited navigation. It includes the upland, wetlands, ponds, and streams that all contribute to the river's flow. And this watershed area is an expansive area of 27 square miles that extends to East Fall River and beyond into Westport and Tiverton, Rhode Island. This includes the North and South with the ponds, uh, Stafford Pond, Soddy Pond, Duval Pond, and a series of smaller ponds and a portion of the Pocasset Cedar Swamp. Again, it creates the volume of fresh water that was required for the textile mills to process their products. And here's a picture. This is actually an old postcard that I found that you can find on the library's website, believe it or not. We have over a thousand, uh, so self, selfish, uh, self-promotion here. We have over a thousand postcards that you can look at for free off of our website. Uh, hosted on uh, Digital Commonwealth, and you can find other fun postcards all from the, from the city. So here's one of the Narrows on Lake Watapa. You can kind of see in the background, you see those trains over there towards the background. I thought it was a really, really cool little picture there to include. And next we have the hills in the sea, uh, seaside, excuse me, hillside, where the fresh water meets steep top topography. The flowing water now becomes a raging torrent rushing 130 feet down a steep gradient. This is where the Quickishan River Falls is located. And the combination of the gradient change and water volume results in the creation of latent power. And it this provided the power necessary for the early growth of our textile industry. And here we go. Here's a picture that I found really strong looking falls there. And all that power powers the, powers the mills and gets the job done. Really cool picture right there. And finally, we have our saltwater coastal environment. And this is where the river meets the navigable salt water of Mount Hope Bay and the Taunton River. Usually the falls of a freshwater river are located more inland from a coastal area and not navigable to the coast. Uh, here for us, the falls are right at the coast. And this lower saltwater environment provides immediate water access to the outside world, allowing efficient delivery of bulk raw goods to the city and finished goods to be shipped away. And here's another postcard image of some really cool uh, sail, sailboats out on Mount Hope Bay in front of the, the old boathouse. So here is the portion where I'm going to be talking about the Fall River Line Railroad and how the beginnings of this railroad really jump-started our economic growth here. So really brief history for you guys, because I could go make a more detailed presentation just on like the beginnings of the railroad. So this is going to be a real quick blurb for you. I promise. The railroad in Fall River began in the 1840s when the Taunton, the Taunton Branch Railroad authorized to build a line from Fall River to New Bedford. Surrounded by water, travel to Fall River required crossing waterways at some point in your journey. The first line built was from Fall River and went to Myrick's. And this was called the Old Road and would eventually be combined into the Old Colony Railroad. By 1846, trains ran 43.75 miles between Fall River and Boston. 
travel time took roughly two and a half hours, two hours, 25 minutes. And fare from Fall River to Boston cost $1.35. And to New Bedford, it cost 85 cents. A little cheaper than what we pay for now on the commuter rail. With Fall River passengers looking to get to Boston, they would switch tra uh, trains in Braintree where Old Colony Railroad trains would finish the trip. At one point, a special boat train out of Boston on Old, Colon on Old Colony Rails would transfer to the Fall River Steamboat Wharf. And starting in 1847, the beginning of a combined rail steamboat service known as the New York and Boston Steamboat Express. And for 90 years, almost 100 years, guys, uh, this combination from Boston and Fall River Line steamboats provided reliable, attractive, daily through service overnight from New York to Boston. And I just realized I skipped to my next point on this presentation. The next one is about the freight service of the train service. So the first one is for coal. Uh, Fall River trains carried a variety of freight as well as passengers. As industry and commerce grew, mills required more cotton to spin and more coal to generate steam for the coreless engines to run the looms. In 1872, the old colony opened substantial coal docks over in Somerset. The docks were on the west shore of the Taunton River across from the north end of Fall River. Coal from Pennsylvania was unloaded at Somerset and transferred to the railroad for delivery locally and to inland New England ports. The old, those old colony docks across the way accommodated four barges at one time. And here's a picture, if we've never seen it before, of a coreless engine and a textile mill. So they needed a lot of coal to get these, uh, get these bad boys to really crank out product. And this is a picture of a locomotive with its train carts filled with, if you can kind of see in the back, there's some that's filled with coal. I thought that was a really cool picture to show an example of how much product was going back and forth between cities by rail. It's just a really cool picture overall, I feel. Next freight carried was oil, and Sinclair Oil and New England Oil Refining Company contributed substantial rail traffic. Sinclair Oil, based in Pennsylvania, was expanding its business northeast in the early 1900s. This met an increased demand for automotive fuels during the turn of the 20th century. New England Oil expanded business in Fall River because it was attracted to its docking facilities, efficient oil processing and storage facilities, excuse me, and high, and high capacity rail connections enabling easy access to consumers throughout New England. By 1919, New England oil processed 20, around 20,000 barrels of crude oil daily. Products included Navy A fuel oil, marine and commercial fuel oil, and gasoline. Uh, railroad crews from New Haven were assigned exclusively to Fall River to load up on product and return to Taunton and other ports all over New England. Crews handled around 700 loaded cars a month. Somerset coal dock traffic declined in the early 1900s, leading some yard tracks being used to store tank cars that were late awaiting to be loaded over at the oil works. And there's some other freight as well that was carried by rail. Uh, east of Bowenville Station, track ran west for about a city block to serve the Enterprise Brewery plant. Started in 1898, the business was a steady customer of the railroad as it received carloads of grain and other materials used in production. And then pro prohibition happened. Uh, the buildings were continued to be used as a bonded warehouse and an oil burner manufacturing company that continue to contribute to overall rail 
use. Uh, Borden, Borden, Borden and Remington Corporation was another significant freight customer. Uh, BNR was also was a major supplier of dye products and chemicals for textile mills throughout New England, not just Fall River. And these products were used in the finishing, dyeing, and bleaching of cloth. Here's a fun little picture that I found later on. It gives you a bit of a idea what Enterprise Brewing looked like. It's on the corner there. It was located on uh, 79, if I'm not, so duh, it's right there. Pretty cool picture. Again, taken later on than what I'm talking about here, but you get the idea. The freight services here, there were three classes of freight train operation. Uh, one was yard crews, the other local freight trains, and the last through freights. I'm going to mention very briefly the, def the difference between the three of them. So here's an example of what a yard crew would look like. Uh, I believe they knew they were being photographed. You can kind of see some of them just standing there posing with their hands on their hips. It's another really cool picture. So first are our yard crews. They worked out of Fall River and they switched cars that came in for delivery to various industries. Uh, they worked out of a Fall River yard south of Ferry Street and they assembled outbound trains and switched local customers. So not just freight, but passengers as well, live people who walk. Our local freights, uh, these folks brought cars into or out of Fall River from stations between Myricks on, on the north and Newport on the south. The Providence line was served by local crews from East Providence, excuse me, and later Providence proper. Uh, freight work was handled by Fall River crews, consisted, oops, I skipped a page, huh? consisted of a sonnet and the Shell Oil facility on the river just south of Somerset Junction and the Newport line to the south. Here's a little map of the local service of Fall River. You can see where Ferry Street is all the way to the south. You have your Fall River Line Steamboat Wharf Station with the train station right to the east of there, a little north, a couple blocks up. You have Bowenville, and you have Slade's Ferry Bridge, which at the time was used as both a civilian walkway and a um, railroad on the top, something really cool that I didn't know. You have Brayton Station after that, with the lines going to Providence, Rhode Island. Our through freight service, our last service here, in the 19th and 20th century, freight moved from the ports wars to Fall River Industries and New England points, especially in and around Boston and as far north as Maine. Various industries in eastern, eastern Massachusetts received materials from the port of Fall River by rail and conversely forwarded manufactured goods to the port, especially for the Fall River line to reach mid-Atlantic and southern destinations. There was considerable short haul freight because so much industry, both in the mills and otherwise, was concentrated in New England. Here's where it gets a little more fun, our passenger service. Our main goal goes a little unsaid, but I'm going to say it anyway. Our main goal of passenger service here was to get passengers to and from Boston. We're not going to play around here. As well as to provide convenient connections for Bostonians and other New Englanders with a daily boat train to and from New York. During the early 20th century, there were seven possible Fall River to Boston routes. And during the 1920s and the Depression, uh, these were particularly hard times for the uh, Fall River Passenger Service. In 1920, there were 12 weekday round trips to Boston and 11 to Newport. By 1932, there were just six to Boston and five to Newport. Here's an example of a locomotive that would have been used to transport passengers as well. It's a New Haven train. It's a really cool locomotive there. 
the ironworks. These, this, which I didn't know before I did this, the ironworks were a major player in the Fall River line with the steamboats and the steamships and that service. So to kick that off, we're gonna look at the ironworks and their subsidiary enterprises. The ironworks proved to be invaluable in the development of the city's textile industry. Without it, a smaller amount of capital would have been available for textile mill expansion, but it diversified the local economy and stimulated the development of a significant local textile machinery industry, which proved to be, very, to be a very important advantage for the cotton textile industry as a whole. By its advancement, of steamship connections to New York City and the railroads to Fall River, the ironworks assured that the textile industry was served by a first-rate transportation infrastructure. Fall River's location, where water power was located at Tidewater, allowed the convenient movement of raw and finished iron products by ship and gave the ironworks site a distinct advantage for iron produce manufacturing. It also took advantage of its coastal location, again location, location, location here, and they imported raw materials such as scrap iron from other coastal cities, bar iron from Sweden and Russia, and eventually Philly, Philadelphia, and Birmingham, Alabama. In addition to making hoops for New Bedford's whale oil casks, the ironworks manufacturer manufactured rolled iron for the region shipbuilding industry and for general uses such as castings for machinery, nails, and spikes. Here we are, here's a picture of our ironworks as well as American uh, manufacturing. Right near the water, I really like this picture because it shows how close the ironworks were to the water. You have your steamboats out in the background, you have a ferry, uh, steamship over to the right, I wouldn't call the street bustling, but it does look a little busy in this rendition. So really, really close. By 1840, we're gonna look at how much product was produced and sold. There were 38,441 casks of nails produced. They weighed around 100 pounds each, 950 tons, of barrel hoops, 250 tons of shapes and rods from bar iron, and 400 tons of castings. It's something I found really interesting. With the barrel hoops, they were both uh, round and square. Never thought of that until now. This uh, the excuse me, the Ironworks Group initiated and controlled Steam, steamboat service from Fall River to Providence and Fall River to New York City. Before the ironworks initiated its steamboat service, the only way to travel to other locations was by horse and carriage or by sail. As Fall River began to grow as a textile center, <clears throat> around 1813, a focus was placed on passenger travel by water as well as just freight and product. Again, here's another picture of the ironworks. Later on, it's in color, but again, super close to the water, location, 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 like I've said a million times now. Traveling by water. Uh, Fall River to New York City was a 24-hour trip one way. It left around 8 a.m. and cost between $2 and $5. The cost depended on the accommodations that you were looking for. Passengers did sleep on board, and ships from Fall River always went south, not north. There's a reason behind that. Uh, the trip north would require rounding Cape Cod on rough, open ocean with vessels vulnerable to shifting shoals and frequent fog. South to New York City, however, was much safer because you had the inland waterway of Long Island Sound. Uh, traveling from Boston to New York City, you can't actually do that. You would take a stagecoach 
a stagecoach to Fall River, and then you would sail south to New York City. Early freight hauling by sail at Fall River occurred in vessels that sailed between Providence and Taunton. So we're kind of like the halfway point. Uh, freight was loaded on and off at Slade's Ferry since there was no adequate wharfage at Fall River for all the product. Uh, cotton and other merchandise was loaded here for many, many years. There's another cool picture that I found <coughs> of the port of Fall River. And just really, really cool. You see how close buildings are, and you have the mouth of the river over there, and open to navigable water like I was talking about earlier. Really cool picture. The first regularly scheduled steamboat service on Mount Hope Bay was established by the Fall River Iron Works in 1827. The company purchased the steamer Hancock and initiated the first steamboat service between Fall River and Providence that year. It also ran on alternating days from Fall River to Newport. In 1832, the Hancock was superseded by the King Philip, and you have other steamboats that followed afterwards, finishing with the Richard Board in 1874. And you see some of the steamboats that serve Fall River during the 19th century. And if you wanted to sail the Quekishan River, you actually, you can. Uh, in, the, in the 1840s, a steam vessel called the Enterprise began plying the waters of the Quickishan River. It carried both passengers and freight, much like rival sailing vessels. At the time, all of the folks who owned the sailboats, they were very, very nervous and afraid of what steamboats would do to their economy, to their jobs. So the folks who were into sailboats kind of let it die slowly. They were very weary of adapting steam at one point. Uh, going back to the Enterprise, carried the passengers and freight, and later on, day excursions to picnic rows on the North Watapa Pond were offered. Uh, this is really cool. In order to sail under the, some of the low bridges, uh, the Enterprise was fitted with a smokestack uh, whose base was on a hinge. And so the stack could actually be lowered when it was approaching one of these bridges. Pretty cool, which I wish I, wish I could find a picture of it. I, couldn't find anything very quickly as I was putting the pictures together. I'm sure there's one out there. I would love to see what that actually looked like. Here's a picture of an ad. I don't call it an ad, kind of a portrait with these with the young couple on a Fall River Line steamship going to New York, New York City probably. Really cool picture there. Here we're going to start to get into the Fall River line for the passengers and the steamships that we know of from the pictures, like the Commonwealth. Now, the Ironworks early operation of the Fall River to Newport steamship service and its connections with the Boston stagecoach led to an interest among the Borden family in establishing a Boston to New York rail steamship route once the railroad was extended to Fall River. Again, location, location, location led to the success and beginning of the Fall River Line. Continuous rail service between Boston and New York was possible, but it was a very uncomfortable long trip with poor sleeping conditions. The distance between Fall River and New York City wasn't nearly as much. The wide mouth of the, of the Thames River in Connecticut proved to be a formidable barrier for rail crossing, so this caused the railroad to travel inland to cross where the river was narrower and safer to cross. The total distance of the Fall River line was around 228 miles. 
of all the Long Island Sound boat rail routes, the Fall River service had the lowest tr uh, rail travel time once the steamboat portion was complete. In 1845, steamship service began on the Eudora, and this was the first steamboat to operate uh, between Fall River and New York City. During its first year alone, it carried 50,000 passengers between the two cities. And here's what one of those boat trains that would get you from Boston to Fall River would look like. You have the locomotive in this first picture. And then the second one is an old, uh, old colony uh, train car called the Pilgrim. You see it kind of looks a little lavish. And really cool there. Although the Fall River line was best known as a passenger line, it was also a freighter service. The Plymouth, for example, could carry the equivalent of 72 railroad boxcars. Uh, this daily freight service to New York City provided enormous advantages to Fall River as a textile center. For example, an order of cloth from New York to Fall River could be placed on an afternoon and it could be delivered the next morning. Other freight included fish from Newport. And by May 20th, 1887, 1,400 barrels of scup were loaded, little fish, were loaded on Fall River steamers bound from New York. From Somerset, pottery was often exported, as well as strawberries and other flowers from Dighton. And here we have the Plymouth uh, steamship there, plying the waters. And finally, as we start to wrap it up here, the Fall River Line steamers were quoted as being fondly remembered by more than one generation as the scene of their most romantic moments. These steamers were widely popular among couples of all ages during their honeymoons. The lavish Fall River steamers appealed to an upscale crowd who were attracted to the lines beautiful interiors and excellent dining, and it was comparable with any first-class large restaurant of the day. Uh, the Commonwealth, we'll see that in like a couple of uh, slides here, was actually described as being a, ho like a lavish hotel on the water. So, and there's a couple cool pictures that I've included as well. Uh, some of the notable passengers included uh, James Polk, our 11th president, Ulysses S. Grant, Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, uh, Benjamin Harrison, Theodore Roosevelt, FDR, and my personal favorite, uh, Amelia Earhart. So you've got some cool clientele who use this service. And here we have the Commonwealth. Launched in 1907, she became one of the most popular ships to ply between New York and New England. It was 456 feet in length, displacing 5,410 tons, and it was capable of 20 knots. It didn't take too long for her to be considered not only the largest steamer to sail uh, Long Island Sound, but also the fastest. And. I found this ad in one of the books that I was looking for more pictures for this presentation. And although you might not be able to read the words that are below the headline, I managed to get a copy that I can read to you guys. So the ad says, New Steamer Commonwealth, a majestic hotel afloat, outrivaling in size, speed, and elegance any vessel plying on inland waters. And the rest of the ad continues to say that it's the largest and newest of the superb steamers of the New England Navigation Company's world-renowned fleet as the Commonwealth. She will be placed in service on the Fall River line route during the early summer. The Commonwealth is the most beautiful model of her type of craft ever built. She excels in size and magnificence any vessel heretofore built for service on inland waters. 
Almost as large as an ocean liner, she is sumptuous and quite as elegant in point of de decoration as the newest greyhound of the sea. The Commonwealth is constructed of steel and has a double hull. She is 456 feet in length and 96 feet in breadth. She has accommodations for 2,000 passengers. So perfect is the system of watertight bulkheads throughout the steamer that she is practically unsinkable. <laughs> In every detail of her construction and equipment, the Commonwealth typifies the highest skill of the marine architect. The completion of this craft represents an outlay of $2 million. And here's some of the pictures of the interior. Sadly, black and white, these were, I thought, were some of the coolest pictures that I found. The first one is the lobby. It was constructed in a modern English style with oak wood. The second picture, uh, top right, is a bedroom, which for whatever odd reason, I find that one like a little creepy. It might be like the bed, but I don't know. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies looking at that. I don't know about you guys. And then underneath, bottom right, is a barber shop. I thought it was a dentist place at first. I was like, no, that doesn't make sense. The barber, sh barber shop makes much more sense. This picture is the main lounge, and it's called the Grand Salon, where the passengers could sit, relax, and socialize. This picture you might be able to make out. It was taken on top of the stairs there, looking down. Uh, there was another picture that was like super teeny tiny, but it showed, you flipped it. So you were standing behind, if you see those two uh, lamps down at the bottom, the picture was taken behind the lamp. So you were looking up the stairs rather than down. And the stairs themselves, like beautiful, I assume they would be like red carpets. It was really, really cool. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the picture to look clear because it was teeny tiny in the book. And finally, does anyone want to take a guess what this room is? Who said that? Very close. Any other guesses? Oh, who said that? You get a gold star. It's the library on the, on the Commonwealth, which I'm biased, but I figured that was a super cool thing for the steamship to have. And finally, that is the end. If anyone has any questions, that's a picture of the uh, Providence steamship. If anyone has any questions, you can ask them. Otherwise, thank you guys for listening to me.